thank you for joining us. And I'll begin with a brief introduction and then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Manisha Sina is the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut and a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow. She received her PhD from Columbia University where her dissertation was nominated for the Bancroft Prize. She is the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina, featured in the 1619 Project. And The Slaves Cause, A History of Abolition, which won the Frederick Douglass, Avery Craven, James Rawley, Sheer Best Book Prizes, and was also long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. She is the eighth recipient of the James W.C. Pennington Award for 2021 from the University of Heidelberg, Germany. In 2018, she was a visiting professor at the University of Paris, Diderot, and was elected to the Society of American Historians. She is on the advisory council of the American Civil War Museum and of the Lapidus Center for the Historical Analysis of Transatlantic Slavery at the Schomburg, New York Public Library. Her latest book, The Rise and Fall of the Second American Revolution, A Long History of Reconstruction, 1860 to 1900, is forthcoming from Liberite. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We will go ahead and uh, transfer uh, the movement and the navigation of the slides to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for that generous introduction. And I would also like to thank Raven um, for answering numerous emails from me uh, and Michelle Neri for, for facilitating today's presentation. Um, so in my talk today, I wanted to um, go back to my previous work on the abolition movement uh, and talk about how the concept of black citizenship became central to the reconstruction of American democracy after the Civil War, that brief period uh, when uh, you had black citizenship and interracial democracy and black men won the right to vote and to hold office. Um, and the argument that I'm trying to present to you today, and you may have read about a bit about it from my book, if you had a chance uh, to do that, is to look at the abolitionist movement and see how it was a movement that was geared not simply to end slavery, but also to establish black political equality. And it is really the abolitionist debate over the slave over slavery and its place in the US constitutional order and the abolitionist commitment to establishing black citizenship that I think sets up the changes of reconstruction. Uh, it's often not looked at the abolitionist roots of reconstruction and, and that's what I want to emphasize today. So on the eve of the Civil War, when the political success of the Republican Party in the North seemed imminent, most abolitionists felt that they and the Free Soilers were part of a grand anti-slavery political coalition. And of course, I'm talking about the Republican Party of the 19th century, the party of Lincoln and anti-slavery, political and racial liberalism, and of big government. Now, the relationship between the abolition movement and political anti-slavery in the antebellum North was intimate and symbiotic, but they were not one and the same. Writing about the revolutionary era, the historian David Bryan Davis contended that abolition was, quote, the most activist expression of anti-slavery. And indeed, I argue that we need to distinguish between the abolitionist commitment to black political equality with those who were simply anti-slavery in sentiment. Now, from the creation of the American Republic to the sectional controversies, controversies over abolitionist petitions, as in the gag rules, fugitive slaves, and the extension of slavery to the West, abolition and political anti-slavery were allied. Not only did the roots of Reconstruction constitutionalism with its emphasis on black rights lie in abolition, but radical free soilers were either political abolitionists themselves or had close ties to the movement. So if we were to draw a Venn diagram to represent abolition as a social movement and free soil political parties, radical Republicans would inhabit the middle of two overlapping circles. 
Now, the anti-slavery platform, call it Freedom National, like Charles Sumner, or the denationalization of slavery, like Salmon P. Chase, both were founders of the Republican Party, were not, was not abolition, but it could lead or pave the way to abolition. Most abolitionists understood that, as did most Southern slaveholders who viewed free soilism, or the non-expansion of slavery, as an existential threat and used the election of Abraham Lincoln on that platform as good reason to secede from the Union. We cannot, however, collapse abolitionism into republicanism or vice versa. The politics of abolition, like its constituency, was multifaceted, diverse, and contentious. It included, after all, African Americans and women. No one slogan or program can encapsulate it, except perhaps human rights, a term abolitionists first popularized. Now, abolitionists' rich debates over the nature of the United States Constitution and the use of law and state action, that's government action, to not just destroy slavery, but also establish African-American citizenship fed into that outcome. Reconst if Reconstruction constitutional theory was the vehicle through which Republican politicians pushed the abolitionist agenda, its abolitionist roots deserve more attention. Now, before the Civil War, sectional compromise and the desire to preserve the Union and reverence for the constitutional compact between the states thwarted abolitionist aims. The Constitution, Northern Emancipation Laws that were passed during the Revolutionary Era, and anti-slavery jurisprudence were not sufficient in and of themselves to establish the freedom principle in the country and to challenge the extraterritoriality for the laws of slavery claimed by slaveholders. Behind every landmark anti-slavery decision, starting with the famous Somerset case of 1772 in Britain, to the Dred Scott case in 1857, lay an enslaved litigant and abolitionist lawyers. And I think it's really important to em emphasize that many of these landmark anti-slavery cases were initiated by the enslaved themselves. They were not only voting with their feet in escaping slavery, but were actually trying to use the law as an instrument of liberation to demand rights and make freedom claims. Now, the rise of interracial immediatism in the United States, that is, those who argued for the immediate abolition of slavery without compensation to slaveholders, the rejection of anti-slavery gradualism and colonization, which was this project to colonize all free black people back to Africa. It was one that many American statesmen from Jefferson to Lincoln believed in. And the adoption of moral suasion as a tactic that was a tactic to use moral means to make slaveholders give up slavery all of these ideas never led to the abandonment of political and legal strategies. Abolitionists combined radical rhetoric with circumspect means, reviving abolitionist early abolitionist petition campaigns for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia and against the admission of new slave states. And this is a point that is well worth noting that slavery was legal in Washington, D.C. right up to the Civil War. Yet abolitionists were frequently the target of mob violence, North and South, as fanatics who threatened the Union and Constitution. The lessons of the 1830s made William Lloyd Garrison and his followers move towards non-resistance, a radical critique of the church and state and women's rights. Garrison's evangelical and political critics sought to purge the abolition movement of his heresies, that threatened to make it even more unpopular. And I should point out that these evangelical abolitionists should not be confused with contemporary evangelicals who owe their origins more to the southern halves of the American church uh, and tended to defend slavery. Um, these were more progressive evangelicals associated with the abolition movement. So far from being an extremist minority, Abolitionism had an impact on the national political arena. 
leading John C. Calhoun, the leading uh, slaveholding senator from South Carolina's uh, lieutenants to make respectful inquiries of James Burney, Secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, founded in 1833, on the exact strength of its affiliates' membership, meaning slave-owning planter politicians detected abolition as a threat right from the start, even when it was a minority. The Anti-Slavery Committee of Joshua Leavitt and Theodore Weld, pictured here on the left, as well as the work of other political abolitionists like Benjamin Lund Lundy and David Lee Child, alerted anti-slavery politicians, who at that time were mainly what we call conscience Whigs, anti-slavery Whigs, to slaveholders, quote, atrocious plot to annex Texas and reintroduce slavery there, and fed them abolitionist research for their speeches. In 1838, Welt published The Power of Congress over the District of Columbia, in which he argued that the constitutional power of the federal government to legislate for the district was so clear that it defies misconstruction. Welt also researched the, quote, rights of colored citizens under the U.S. Constitution, insisting, like most political abolitionists, that the Constitution's Equal Privileges and Immunities Clause applied two African-Americans who were citizens of the Northern states. Abolitionist ideas made some headway when federal courts held that Southern states' Negro seamen laws, which imprisoned all free black seamen visiting Southern ports, violated the US Constitution and American treaties. So already political abolitionists are slowly already in the 1830s making this argument that the federal government must respect citizenship rights of black people. The next year, the abolitionist judge, William J., pictured here on your right, explicitly connected the powers of the federal government with black citizenship. Despite holding, quote, our fathers, and here the son of John J. was speaking literally, guilty of the constitutional compromises over slavery, he argued that the constitution recognized no differences based on color. But the federal government, quote, oppress and degrade the free people of color, he noted with its racist citizenship and militia laws, which had been passed very early in the Republic uh, in the 1790s. The federal government had used its power in particular to debase the free black population of the district with a host of petty restrictions and aided slaveholders, quote, in trampling upon those great principles of human rights by operating on the assumption that all free blacks were fugitive slaves. Domestically and internationally, Jay argued, the US government had acted as the handmaiden of slavery, violating constitutionally guaranteed rights of citizens upholding the domestic slave trade and slavery, refusing to recognize what he called, quote, the heroic Republic of Haiti, warring against the Seminoles in Florida, demanding the rendition of fugitive slaves and compensation of slave rebels who had made their way to the British West Indies, tolerating an illegal African slave trade that had been abolished by the US in 1808, infringements on civil liberties and freedom of speech of black and white abolitionists, and plotting to annex Texas. Implicit in Jay's argument was the notion that Northerners should redeem the federal government from being a tool of slaveholders. The quote, rapid sale of his pamphlet led to a second edition in 1844. In a companion pamphlet on the condition of the free people of color, Jay listed the disabilities on black citizenship in the slaveholding Republic. The lack of quote, elective franchise, denial of rights of locomotion, impediments to education, susceptibility to enslavement, and, quote, subjection to insult and outrage. The federal government not only sustained but subsidized slavery, reimbursing its functionaries, especially army officers in the Western frontiers, for employing slave labor. With good reason, abolitionists and anti-slavery politicians made redeeming the federal government from the clutches of, quote, the slave power their highest priority. Now, unlike Weld and Jay, who did not challenge the federal consensus that the federal government had no authority to interfere in slavery in the southern states, some Liberty Party constitutionalists went further. 
And I should mention that in 1840, the abolition movement split amongst Garrisonians and political abolitionists who felt that they should fight within the electoral system to further the aims of abolition. Now, a lawyer and one of the founders of the party, Alvin Stewart, pictured here, argued that the Constitution's guarantees of citizenship, which were violated by slavery, allowed the federal government to abolish slavery in the southern states. So he did not have much use for the principle of federalism. He felt that the federal government should go ahead and abolish slavery. He pronounced slavery unconstitutional on the basis of the Fifth Amendment, which stipulated that no person could be deprived of life, liberty, and property without the due process of law. And this, in fact, becomes the due process clause of the 14th Amendment during Reconstruction. Now, quote, in a constitutional argument on the subject of slavery, Stewart urged the federal government to abolish slavery in order to fulfill the constitutional guarantee of Republican government, that is representative government, in the southern states and in accordance with the general welfare. And this is precisely the constitutional clause that Republicans would use to legitimize and inaugurate the policy of Reconstruction after the Civil War. Stewart died in 1849, and though Free Soilers rejected his constitutional views, he influenced radical political abolitionists such as Garrett Smith, William Goodell, and after his break with the Garrisonians, Frederick Douglass. Now, the emergence of political abolitionism forced Garrison and his allies to develop their own stance on politics often mischaracterized as an outdated adherence to moral suasion or as apolitical. Rejecting electoral politics, Garrisonians developed the politics of agitation. And here's Garrison pictured on the bottom right. The fugitive slave controversy played a crucial role in Garrison's rejection of what he called a pro-slavery union and constitution. In 1842, Chief Justice Joseph Story in the Supreme Court case Sprig versus Pennsylvania declared Northern personal liberty state laws that gave free blacks and suspected fugitives certain legal protections, due process and trial by jury unconstitutional. That year, Garrison announced his doctrine of disunion in his abolitionist newspaper, the famous Liberator, quote, a repeal of the union between Northern liberty and Southern slavery is essential to the abolition of one and to the preservation of the other. For Garrisonians, disunionism was a concerted attack on slaveholders' political power and not a retreat into inaction. And in fact, one could argue that the Civil War achieved precisely what Garrison wanted, which was uh, booting out of slaveholders from uh, the compact, the constitutional compact. By 1844, the official policy of the Garrison-led American Anti-Slavery Society, which was founded in 1833, became, quote, no union with slow slaveholders. The union, Garrison pointed out in his address to the Friends of Freedom and Emancipation in the United States, was bought, quote, at the expense of the colored population of the country. Garrison expected opposition at so, quote, bold and, revolu and revolutionary a step, but argued that in advocating it, the American Anti-Slavery Society had taken the highest possible ground against slavery. Now, Garrison's inspiration for his condemnation of the Constitution as pro-slavery lay close to home. Unknown to historians, and this was one of my aha moments when I wrote my book on abolition, um, I discovered that Garrison derived his famous indictment of the Constitution as, quote, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell from the Black abolitionist, Reverend James W.C. Pennington, pictured here on top. In 1842, at the height of the controversy over the fugitive slave, George Latimer in Massachusetts, Pennington del delivered a sermon to his Hartford congregation in Connecticut. Covenants involving moral wrong are not obligatory upon man, which began with a biblical quotation from the book of Isaiah. Quote, and your covenant with death 
shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. Pennington argued that, quote, laws and compacts designed to legalize the system of human bondage, like the constitutional obligation to deliver up fugitive slaves, ought to be swept away as they involved disobedience to God. And of course, Pennington was a clergyman. He evoked a higher law long before it became popular with anti-slavery politicians such as William Seward during the Compromise of 1850 when Seward made his famous higher law speech. Pennington, who ironically was associated with the Tappanite or evangelical wing of the abolition movement, used that characterization just for the fugitive slave clause of the constitution and the federal fugitive slave law. A fugitive slave himself, Pennington was a self-educated clergyman, teacher, and abolitionist known for his erudition. I thought the teachers would enjoy this, this factoid. He was a teacher in schools in, in Brooklyn, in Long Island, and also taught in schools associated with his church in Hartford. Pennington became the first African-American to be awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg in 1849. And as was mentioned in the introduction, I should say that Heidelberg on its 625th anniversary in 2011 endowed a Pennington Fellowship for which I had the honor to deliver the inaugural lecture and for which President Obama at that time sent his felicitations. He is one of these abolitionists whose political and constitutional thought we should know more about. Garrison simply extended Pennington's biblical indictment of the fugitive slave clause to the entire constitution. And he did this much later in the 1850s when federal troops were used to enforce the draconian new fugitive slave law of 1850 um, and when Anthony Burns was rendered back to slavery from the streets of Boston. Now, Garrisonians and political abolitionist stances on the nature of the Constitution developed in response to each other. In 1844, Wendell Phillips, a lawyer by training, presented the full-blown Garrisonian argument in the Constitution, a pro-slavery compact. Phillips went beyond the specific constitutional clauses dealing with slavery. You know them, the three-fifths clause, the fugitive slave clause, the African slave trade clause, though he listed all of them. Mining James Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention debates, which had been published for the first time in 1840, to prove the intent of the framers to protect slavery, Phillips concluded that the Constitution was, quote, an infamous bargain that proved the melancholy fact that our fathers bartered honesty for gain and became partners with tyrants that they might profit from their tyranny a radical abolitionist indictment of their sacrosanct liberty-loving reputation. His reputation, though, began with a quotation from John Quincy Adams, that the very purposes of the national government had been prostituted for the protection and preservation of slavery, and he conceded the argument of political abolitionists that the Constitution had been put to increasingly pro-slavery use over the years. But for Phillips, the Constitution in its original form, as is, was, pro-slavery. A year later, in Can Abolitionists Vote or Take Office Under the United States Constitution, Phillips argued that the American Anti-Slavery Society's opposition to a pro-slavery government and laws should not be mistaken as endorsing a no government or non-resistant position, which is basically like an anarchist position virtually, which abolitionists like Garrison and Lucretia Mott supported. Um, they challenged the use of force, uh, by the United States government. They were against capital punishment, against all wars. It was kind of a radical form of pacifism. Phillips, though, argued that he had judged all institutions, including the Constitution, no matter how venerable, by the touchstone of anti-slavery principle and found them wanting. The American Anti-Slavery Society published an expanded version of his pamphlet with an endorsement from its executive committee. It went through three editions, meriting a response from political abolitionists associated with the Liberty Party. Now, William Goodell's a view of, a views of American constitutional law in its bearing upon American slavery, which was published in 1844, and Massachusetts lawyer Lysander Spooner's the unconstitutionality of slavery 
published a year later, and you can see Goodell on the left and Spooner on the right, were the most detailed expositions of the political abolitionist position. Goodell's treaties began with a deceptively simple premise that the American government and constitution cannot be viewed as neutral or even partial on the subject of slavery. It must either be completely for or against liberty, as even a slight toleration of slavery would endanger all liberty in the American Republic. If it was pro-slavery, as the Garrisonians argued, then abolitionists indeed would have the option to the right of revolution or submission. But he argued that the slaveholders' pro-slavery reading of the Constitution was based on their complete rejection of democracy, their defense of slavery, and contempt for the laboring masses, black and white. He refuted it with their own principle of strict construction, arguing that the Constitution did not recognize slavery since slavery reduced human beings to chattel property, things, and the Constitution only alluded to persons never to slaves or slavery. For Goodell, anti-slavery was bound up with the development of human freedom and republicanism in the Anglo-American world. The democratic spirit of the Constitution with its positive exhortations on liberty and rights, like that of English common law, the Declaration of Independence, and he even mentioned the New Testament, which did not include specific abolitionist injunctions, were all anti-slavery. According to Goodell, all anti-slavery men need not be democratic Republicans, but all democratic Republicans must be anti-slavery. His was the radical democratic interpretation that privileged ideas over the facts unearthed by Phillips. In a public letter to John G. Whittier, the abolitionist Quaker poet, Garrett Smith called the Constitution, quote, a noble and beautiful temple of liberty based on the defense of human rights that had simply been perverted to pro-slavery ends. Even the three-fifths clause, Smith argued, could not prevent a northern majority from voting in an anti-slavery government. And indeed, that is precisely what happened with Lincoln's election in 1860. Similarly, according to Spooner, all law, especially constitutional law, must be based on principles of natural rights and justice. The fact that the African slave trade and slavery were tolerated in the American colonies was no argument for their legality. Also making a historical argument, Spooner wrote that slavery was not recognized in either the state constitutions or the Articles of Confederation. And if slavery did not have, quote, a constitutional existence, Earlier, it certainly did not under the Constitution, which recognized all people, including black people, as citizens. Like Goodell, Spooner argued that the Constitution recognized only persons, not chattels personal, persons held to ser service, referred to servants and not slaves. Furthermore, the preamble referred to all the people of the United States, not just whites or free people, as citizens of the country. The only guarantee in the Constitution concerned not slavery, despite the, quote, arrogant and bombastic claims of slaveholders, but a Republican form of government which slavery contravened. Spooner concluded that the anti-slavery nature of the Constitution guaranteed that all the children of slaves were born free and ought to be freed immediately by federal judges. So these political abolitionists were really arguing that slavery lay within what one historian has called outside the zones of law. It was within the zones of violence. And that if we adhered to the principles of constitutional law and the rule of law, then in fact, slavery was not um, supported by any institution or the constitution of the United States. Now, for Phillips, Goodell's and Spooner's beliefs was dangerous because for abolitionist activists, they denied the possibility that governments and laws could be unjust. Abolitionists might as well just bury their heads in the sand and wait for the law and constitution to work out their destiny. In his review of Spooner's book, Phillips proceeded to dismantle each one of his historical and constitutional arguments, but ended with admiration for their, quote, ingenuity. In the constitutional debate, both sides did the other a disservice. 
while political abolitionists sought to harness the power of the state, that is the government, for abolition, Garrisonians, far from simply endorsing the pro-slavery constitutional argument of Southern secessionists and Calhounites, called for its revolutionary remaking, which is precisely what happened during Reconstruction. Now, political abolitionists were more interested in dismantling slaveholders' constitutional claims than simply sparring with the Garrisonians. As in biblical interpretation, while slaveholders championed a literal and strict instruction construction of the Constitution, abolitionists appealed to its liberal spirit. And this was important in the 19th century. If you had the Bible and the Constitution on your side, you pretty much would have won the debate. Anti-slavery constitutional theory emerged from this rich and long abolitionist debate on the relationship of slavery to the Constitution. And interestingly enough, um, lawyers and historians continue to debate this issue. What was the exact relationship of slavery to the US Constitution? Among abolitionists, there was no consensus, but anti-slavery politicians were able to distill the most effective political and constitutional anti-slavery strategy from the de that debate sure to appeal to the largest number of Northern voters. They built on the political abolitionist idea that slavery was the creature of positive state law, the slave codes, and in contravention to the constitution, but dropped the abolitionist insistence on black citizenship and immediate abolition in the Southern states. The person who best developed the constitutional uh, theory, what he called constitutional anti-slavery, was the Ohio politician. And I see the slides are not in order here, so I'm going to put this one up first. Um, Salmon P. Chase. In the 1837 Matilda case, Chase adopted abolitionist James Burney's argument that the fugitive slave law was unconstitutional, repugnant to the Fourth and Fifth Amendments on unreasonable seizures and due process of law and Northern state emancipation laws. Chase was defending Burney for harboring Matilda, a fugitive slave against her rendition to her owner. The constitutional clause on recaption, he also concluded, applied to servants and not slaves, as the Constitution did not recognize right of property in man. Bernie published Chase's arguments in a widely circulated pamphlet and wrote to abolitionist Lewis Tappan that it had done much for the cause, though Matilda lost her dearly won freedom. And again, showing how an, an, an ordinary slave, her freedom claims and her freedom suits actually led to all these arguments and ideas about the Constitution. Evoking the positive prohibition of slavery in Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance, which of course was passed in 1787 and barred the spread of slavery north and west of the Ohio River, Chase established himself as, quote, the Attorney General of Fugitive Slaves. He fought many cases whose decisions effectively nullified slaveholders' right to transit with their slaves in Ohio. In the 1845 case of a Virginian runaway, Samuel Watson, Judge Reed, who had argued on the side of the prosecution in Matilda, conceded Chase's argument on transit. To commemorate the decision, Cincinnati's Black community presented Chase with a silver pitcher. Again, showing how African Americans enlisted anti-slavery lawyers and abolitionists to establish their claims to equality and citizenship. And this was true in black conventions that were held in Ohio, in New York, all over the North at local, state and national levels where African Americans made this claim to black citizenship long before the Civil War and Reconstruction. Now, Chase joined the Liberty Party in 1841 and became an advocate of broadening its appeal in the North. He used abolitionist ideas to reassure Northerners of the constitutionally legitimate nature of the anti-slavery political project. Unlike most political abolitionists and conceding considerable ground to the Garrisonians, he argued that the Constitution protected slavery, but only in the Southern states and that the founding principles of the country were anti-slavery as they visualized an end to slavery. 
The Constitution gave full powers and in fact made it the duty of the federal government to act against slavery in areas under it, the District of Columbia, the federal territories, the interstate slave trade, the fugitive slave clause. His notion of, quote, the divorce of the federal government from slavery became incorporated into the Liberty Party platform of 1844, and his slogan, quote, the denationalization of slavery became the rallying cry of the Free Soil Party that was founded four years later in the aftermath of the Mexican War when the controversy over the expansion of slavery exploded. It was perhaps fed that this adept theorist of anti-slavery constitutionalism succeeded Roger Tawney, that avatar of pro-slavery constitutionalism, author of the infamous Dred Scott decision, as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was appointed by Lincoln. But the last, uh, but before I actually go ahead, I should also explain that um, uh, Charles Sumner um, also came up with this notion of divorce of slavery from the powers of the federal government and the use of the powers of, of the federal government against slavery in a doctrine that he called Freedom National. It was the title of one of his speeches against the federal fugitive slave law. He refused to recognize its constitutionality and always called it a bill. And Sumner was a big champion of black rights, uh, both in Massachusetts where he argued uh, for school desegregation and then later on during reconstruction when he authored um, uh, civil rights laws uh, that actually anticipated the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But the last word on abolitionist constitutionalism belongs to the great black abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. In 1851, Douglass had announced his conversion from the Garrisonian doctrine that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document to the argument that it was anti-slavery and required political action against slavery. Douglas gained a much needed infusion of funds for his new newspaper from his new mentor, Garrett Smith, acquired the subscription list of the old Liberty Party paper and the black abolitionist Samuel Ringgold Ward's impartial citizen. Again, the title of Ward newspapers shows the ways in which African Americans were already fighting for citizenship rights regardless of race and previous condition of servitude. All that would come to pass with the Reconstruction Constitutional Amendments. Like Smith, Douglas adhered to abolitionists rather than anti-slavery constitutional theory, but he also supported free soil parties. He argued that the federal government had the constitutional authority to directly abolish slavery in the states, but at the same time, he supported the Republican Party ticket of 1856, which was just the non-expansion of slavery. Douglas tended to focus on free soilers like Charles Sumner, whose commitment to black equality was indisputable. Now, like most political abolitionists, Douglas combined a literal reading of the nation's legal document, stressing that neither slavery nor slaves were specifically mentioned in it, with the abolitionist insistence that Kant's constitutional guarantees of citizenship rights included African Americans. He went further. The original intent of its framers, many of whom he well knew were slaveholders, Douglas implied was irrelevant. This claim was bold in the context of 19th century American constitutionalism, when both slaveholding Southern and anti-slavery Northern politicians regularly sought to enlist the founders on their side of the sectional conflict. Anticipating modern constitutional theorists, Douglas argued that the Constitution was a living document whose democratic promise must be extended by subsequent generations. As he put it in his speech, which was published as a pamphlet, the Constitution of the United States. Is it pro-slavery or anti-slavery? And this was published actually just on the eve of um, the Civil War. Slaveholders had given the Constitution a pro-slavery interpretation, Douglas argued. But the Constitution, quote, will afford slavery no protection when it shall cease to be administered by slaveholders. The real purpose of abolitionist constitutionalism was not to simply trace, to stay true to the original intent of its framers as pro-slavery literalists 
and strict constructionists argued, but to use it for anti-slavery purpose. Douglas did invoke the founding generation and their ideals, but in the matter of constitutional interpretation, he asked his and future generations of Americans to imagine black citizenship. By refusing to be held hostage to the original intent of the Constitution's framers, Douglas went well beyond contemporary constitutional debates over slavery and anticipated its remaking. He imagined an interracial democracy in the United States and the overthrow of the lily white slaveholding republic, an abolitionist goal that Republicans sought to achieve, of course, during Reconstruction. In the end, both the Garrisonians and political abolitionists were proven right. Slavery was abolished through federal government action, but in the midst of the enormous bloodletting of the Civil War, a covenant with death indeed. Now, for long abolitionists, like 20th century political theorists, had debated whether the American state was created as a tool of the ruling class, that is the slave power, or whether it was an arena of conflict susceptible to anti-slavery influence. Despite their difference on the nature of the union and constitution, for abolitionists and radical Republicans, anti-slavery was the dominant principle of their politics. Lincoln's position represented that of a majority of anti-slavery moderates in his party. Lincoln's competing loyalties to the Union and Constitution had moderated his anti, genuine anti-slavery beliefs through much of his political career. For an anti-slavery man like Lincoln, the Union, Constitution, and anti-slavery represented dissonant, competing political loyalties before the war. The slaveholders' rebellion solved that problem for him. During the revolutionary crisis generated by Southern secession and civil war, Lincoln's competing political loyalties became compatible. The war allowed a majority of Northerners to align their commitment to the Union, and more importantly, for a lawyer like Lincoln to the Constitution with emancipation in the rebel states. Abolitionist constitutional thought, based on a vindication of Black citizenship rights, bore fruit during the crisis of the Union. When Lincoln abandoned colonization and endorsed limited Black suffrage before his death, he inhabited abolitionist ground. And in fact, I argue in my forthcoming book that Lincoln actually should be seen as the first Reconstruction president as well not only for his support of the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery in the United States, but also because he was the first American president to publicly endorse the idea of black citizenship. Now, the agenda of Reconstruction, fueled by the refusal of former slaveholders to accept the results of emancipation and Andrew Johnson's restoration policies after Lincoln's assassination had long roots in abolitionist constitutionalism. And here, of course, is a, um, a, a portrait of Black Republican congressmen and senators from the reconstructed Southern states after the Civil War. Uh, the idea of Black office holding and voting, the very idea of Black citizenship I argue, was born in these abolitionist debates. So when it was implemented during Reconstruction, it did not just come out of nowhere or as many um, lost cause um, historians and Dunning School historians of Reconstruction argued that it was kind of a vengeful move on the part of Republic Republicans against uh, the defeated South. In fact, it came from this long abolitionist tradition for arguing for black political equality. Now for it to triumph fully new federal laws guaranteeing black civil rights had to be passed. And the first federal civil rights laws are passed during reconstruction in 1866 and 1875. And the constitution would have to be remade with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. The fight for black citizenship 
propelled American state formation during Reconstruction. That means it expanded the powers of the federal government. Until today, reinforced by the events of the civil rights movement, the black view of the federal government as the guardian of citizenship rights stands in glaring contrast to conservatives, anti-status, or anti-big government views. And we can see the origins also of political conservatism in the United States, which rests on a vindication of states' rights um, and against big government right back to this era of the Civil War and Reconstruction when that debate took place first. Now, after 1877, the romance of reunion and a narrow reading or misreading of the Reconstruction amendments by a reactionary Supreme Court that kind of paved the way to Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. There were a series of extremely reactionary Supreme Court decisions that um, undermined federal civil rights laws and constitutional amendments um, that led to the downfall of, of Reconstruction and, in fact, brazenly flouted the intent of Republican lawmakers and eclipsed abolitionist constitutional pr principle. Um, I would argue, though, that despite this eclipse, and I talk a little bit about this, and I don't have the time today to, to venture into it in great depth, that this principle of state formation and progressive constitutionalism that is established by Reconstruction lives on. And I would argue that the 19th Amendment of um, giving, which gave women the right to vote in 1920 and was pretty much based on the wording of the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote, was also a part of the legacy of, of Reconstruction's progressive constitutionalism. But again, I don't have the time to write about it now or talk about it now, but uh, hopefully you will get a chance to read it in the new book. But it had been the long abolitionist struggle for human rights and black citizenship that flowered during Reconstruction. Its promise cut short by racial terror, disfranchisement, segregation, and sharecropping that made a mockery of black freedom. At the same time, these principles did not completely die out. They continued to inspire later struggles, including um, suffrage for women uh, and the civil rights movement. And even today, many of our modern rights uh, comes from the broad egalitarian language of the 14th Amendment and its equal protection law uh, clause, uh, including uh, gay marriage and, in fact, um, also uh, the right to privacy or bodily autonomy in Roe v. Wade, which has recently been overthrown. So this legacy of Reconstruction constitutionalism and the abolitionist debates about how to further the rights of American citizens, regardless of race and gender, um, you know, sort of continues right down to our times. Uh, and it is this contested legacy that I think still shapes the contours of American democracy today. So thank you so much for listening to me so patiently and for so long. I can see that there are a number of questions in Q&A that I would be happy to, to answer um, unless, Mike, you want to step in. Um, yeah, we, and not we can, yeah, we can we can bring a few of the questions in. Um, we have a question from Alberto, who's out in uh, LAUSD. Um, his question was, is, so if slavery was considered unconstitutional, how was it that uh, so many people um, got away with it? How, how is it that um, it became so pervasive in so many areas against uh, reasoning that, uh, you know, countered this, uh, this notion of, 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 of unconstitutionality? Um, so yeah, that that's a really good yeah, uh, that, that's a really good question, Alberto. Um, you know, this was an argument that abolitionists are making, right? Um, and even amongst themselves, they, they sort of sometimes differed with each other. With the Garrisonians saying, no, no, the Constitution is really pro-slavery because of the three-fifths compromise, because of the fugitive slave clause. Um, and the political abolitionists saying, no, the spirit of the Constitution is actually anti-slavery, and we should use that 
and the federal government in particular should use that to act against slavery. So it was not as if it was established that slavery was unconstitutional. It was a debate going on. And of course, Southern slaveholders, um, especially uh, John C. Calhoun, who, who sort of came up with this notion of slaveholders through their state governments being able to nullify federal laws and even secede from the union if things did not go their way, which in fact they did, had a different interpretation of the Constitution. They, they felt that the Constitution protected slavery, uh, but in the end, they felt that it did not protect them enough because once Lincoln was elected um, to the presidency, rather than accept the results of that democratic election, the results of a presidential election, shows you how this has been a constant feature of political contestation in American history. You know, the deep south states just left the union. They refused to accept the results of that election, in a way proving William Goodell, the abolitionist right, that their pro-slavery stance was really anti-democratic also. But to, to, to your question, uh, abolitionists felt that, and particularly political abolitionists and Republican Party um, politicians felt that they could act against slavery under the Constitution. But Southern slaveholders argued, no, the Constitution has given us these ironclad guarantees and protections. And if slavery is questioned in any way, because remember, the Republican Party did not even argue for abolition. They argued for the non-expansion of slavery and for the federal government to use, it, use its powers in areas under it, you know, Washington, D.C., the federal territories, um, interstate commerce, to use those powers to restrict slavery, uh, to prevent its expansion. So it was a, con a contestation that ultimately, I guess, was decided on the battlefields of the Civil War. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. We have a, another one from Michael, who's out in New York City. And um, his question is, 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 it begins with a statement. Matt Karp called the Republicans the most radical political party in Western history, more so than the Jacobins and Bolsheviks. What is your position on that claim? <laughs> Hi, Mike. Uh, that is an interesting uh, question. You know, I know Matt well. Uh, he's a good friend. I, I read his work, and he is, in fact, writing uh, a history of the Republican Party where he argues that it was like a mass Democratic Party um, that really um, challenged the rule of slaveholders. Uh, and to a certain degree, he is right, you know, that, um, you know, I argued in, in, in my first book, um, The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, that, um, that secession was an anti-democratic pro-slavery movement. Um, so the obvious is that, in fact, the Republican Party, um, which arose as a mass democratic party, and this is the last time that a third party uh, has arisen in, in, in the United States, right? We've had a two-party system. We still live with the Republican Democratic Party, though they have switched ideological and political roles uh, today. Uh, but the Republican Party, the anti-slavery Republican Party of the 1850s was a mass democratic party. It was a rising of that. Um, I'm not sure how one could compare it with the Bolsheviks uh, and other revolutionary parties. Uh, it was, after all, a political party within the American constitutional system that had as its goal, um, you know, electoral politics um, of, of winning the presidency or winning political power within the American constitutional order. Uh, in doing so, I argue that the real revolutionary moment really comes during Reconstruction. Um, and that's why the title of my next book is called The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic, that they try to create an interracial democracy. They try to remake the Constitution and they try to establish, in fact, black citizenship and equality. And this is before you had Jim Crow, before you had disfranchise, uh, disfranchisement and the epidemic of racist terror and lynching in the South for another hundred years, which had to be overturned by the civil rights movement. 
So that that was the truly radical movement moment, in my opinion. That's when the Republican Party is no longer just a party of non-extension of slavery. It becomes the party of abolition under Lincoln um, during the Civil War. And at the end of the Civil War, it becomes the party of black rights. And that was pretty revolutionary, in my opinion, this imagining of black equality and citizenship, especially if you think that it is still contested today by some people. So that, in my opinion, was the the really radical moment, though I know that Matt is more interested in the way in which the Republican Party itself came into power on the eve of the Civil War. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, another question um, that we have is not necessarily in the in the chat box, but I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Uh, we're finding that a lot of, uh, particularly at the K-12 level, a lot of districts are focusing on reconstruction, um, true and accurate accounts of, uh, of reconstruction and understanding uh, compromise of 1877 and all those things. But, um, but they're doing so based on parallels to contemporary political events. And so we'd be interested in, in getting your perspective on that. Um, I know we recently went through the midterm elections with the major uh, election out in Georgia, but we'd be interested in getting your perspective on that comparison to contemporary uh, America. Um, that's a great question, Mike, because, um, you know, when the um, last presidential elections occurred and people said, you know, this has never happened in American history, that people have uh, not accepted the results of presidential election. As a Civil War historian, I immediately thought uh, about Lincoln's election, that, that many Southern slaveholders refused to accept. Uh, they would rather destroy the Union than accept the result. Remember, the South seceded not even after John Brown's raid to Harper's Ferry. They seceded because of the results of a presidential election. So I was interviewed a lot in the mainstream media about this. And I said, you know, this has happened before in US history, but it led to a civil war. And hopefully that doesn't happen this time. You know, history, the first time it occurs as tragedy, the next time as fast. Then the, after the January 6th insurrection and the attack on the Capitol, where uh, you had people carrying the Confederate battle flag into the Capitol, which to me was, a travesty, you know, that that battle flag had not made it to the Capitol, even at the height of the Civil War, um, that it should be carried into the Capitol was a desecration, I think, of the United States Capitol. And there were many historians who said, oh, this is awful. This is, you know, this is, this is not who we are. Um, this is not the way American democracy is functioned. And there were others who said, this is exactly who we are, that we have had this long heritage of, of racism, of questioning of democracy. And my position was somewhat in the middle because I argue, and I've always argued, uh, right from my first book, this book on abolition, and now the new book on reconstruction, that it's never that the American experiment has always been about democracy and expanding liberty, nor is it that it has always been about racism and slavery. The fact is that it has always been in contention about these ideas. And this contest appears in different versions right down to our times. Uh, and that's how I see it. It's not who we are, who we are not, but to see how American citizens might try to perfect their democracy and on the other hand, might try to, um, to subvert it. Some might actually try to subvert it rather than extend rights to people who they feel should not get them. So this is a contestation that has always taken place, I think, in American history and continues in our times. Uh, and as teachers, I think, maybe we should understand that more complex, nuanced, complicated story rather than go for simple narratives. Like it was all about freedom. Oh no, it was all about slavery. No, slavery and freedom have been contested in US history right from the start. Uh, and I'll use this opportunity to, to answer a question, another question from Alberto about Lincoln and whether he should be seen an, as an icon. And I actually wrote a piece on this, on Lincoln and abolitionists. Um, so Lincoln was not an abolitionist, but he evolved into endorsing the abolitionist program. Uh, and this is the way in which 
many abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and others who who you know wrote eulogies on him and who met him personally and and got to know him people like Charles Sumner like Frederick Douglass William Lloyd Garrison in the end appreciated that Lincoln was amenable to be moved from non-expansion of slavery to the abolition of slavery and most importantly to black rights to me, that was the abolitionist program. And when Lincoln endorses black rights and his assassin, in fact, says, um, you know, the last speech that Lincoln makes is for um, uh, black soldiers in the Union Army, educated black men, et cetera, to get the right to vote. And that was the speech that John Wilkes Booth, his assassin, heard and, 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 and resolved um, to, to assassinate him of that not for his, for emancipation even, but because of his endorsement and qualified endorsement of black citizenship. So I think we do need to see Lincoln in the end evolving to a position that abolitionists approved of. Yeah, he was not an abolitionist. He was an anti-slavery politician and pretty much a moderate anti-slavery politician through much of his career. You know to your point there, um, so where would the Emancipation Proclamation fall within that spectrum of the, the Union preservation as anti-slavery population po politician and um, someone who began to support abolitionist calls? How will we situate that? Because of course, K through 12 teachers regularly teach that, in, you know, from primary uh, on up. Yeah. And as, and as probably most of your teachers know, historians disagree on this too, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There are some historians who argue that Lincoln and the Republicans' non-expansionist program was really an abolitionist program because they simply wanted to strangle slavery to death. Um, there are others like me who argue that, yes, they, they visualized an end to slavery, but for them it would be this long and gradual process. To me, um, it's important that Lincoln at the start of the war is very concerned with engendering Northern unity. And he makes the war aim at that time simply uh, the non-extension of slavery, but also because he refuses to compromise on that with those who, who want him to do that to prevent war. But is, it is the preservation of the Union, right? He says the preservation of the Union is what everyone could come on board with. But very early in the war, Congress starts moving towards emancipation. And the reason why they do this is because Black people, enslaved people in the South, start voting with their feet as they had always done before the war uh, and, and making out to Union army lines. So what would the Union do? Would they return them as the fugitive slave law required to uh, treasonous slaveholders who were committing war against the Republic? Or would they, you know, um, keep them within Union Army lines? Um, and, and various policies were adopted by Union Army commanders, first declaring them as enemy contraband and therefore subject to confiscation. Then Congress starts moving that, you know, enslaved people used by the Confederacy should be freed. Then they say the enslaved people of all rebel uh, slaveholders should be freed. And Lincoln goes a step further with the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, it's important to remember that Lincoln already decides in the July of 1862, you know, just about a year, a little over a year after the war had started, that he was going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he makes that preliminary proclamation in September 1862, January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. And he goes a step further by saying all enslaved people in the Confederacy are emancipated by this. Now, some people argue, well, you know, he didn't have the authority in the Confederacy to actually free enslaved people uh, because they were in rebellion against the Union. But it really did change um, the course of the war. It's one of the turning points of, of the war. Um, you can see the moment emancipation becomes a formal political aim of the Union and the Lincoln administration, that things start changing pretty fast enlistment of black men into the Union Army, which is the single most important factor in changing Lincoln's mind on black citizenship 
He feels especially strongly that black Union Army soldiers um, should get the rights of citizenship. So the Emancipation Proclamation is an important moment. Um, and I think by linking uh, emancipation to the preservation of the Union, you know, Lincoln links the cause of the slave with that of American democracy. And that's what the Gettysburg Address is all about. Um, and I think we can teach these historical moments without mythologizing people. We can teach these historical moments without um, saying, oh, Lincoln was born as the great emancipator, because he wasn't. Emancipation was a complicated process that involved first and foremost enslaved people, who I argue in an article were architects of their own liberation, by forcing the Union Army and forcing the Lincoln administration to move on emancipation by simply defecting to them. You know, on a very wise political idea, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Um, so it's a process that involves enslaved people. It involves the Union Army, Union Army generals and soldiers. It involves Congress, especially the radical Republicans who are advocating for abolition. It involves black and white abolitionists like Douglas, like Garrison and others who are arguing for abolition uh, outside, including women who, who form themselves into emancipation and national women's loyal leagues in the North. Um, so it's, 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 you know, emancipation is not like the singular event with Lincoln just issuing a proclamation from on top. I always teach it as a process during the war um, that involved all these different historical actors. The president is important, Congress is important, the army is important, but most importantly, if black people hadn't voted with their feet for freedom, then maybe this question would not even have come up. Wow, thank you for that, thank you. Um, you alluded to this a little bit just now, but um, Jamie had a question about the women during this time. What women in this time period should students be aware of? It's a really important question, Jamie. Um, in my book, The Slave's Cause, um, I talk a lot about abolitionist women and the way in which women um, lead the abolitionist petition campaigns, uh, the way in which they become so embroiled in the abolitionist cause that women's rights emerges as a question within the abolition movement. So when you have the emergence of the suffrage movement during Reconstruction, that is uh, a movement to get the right to vote for women, again, it is not coming out of nowhere. It is actually coming out of this tradition of abolitionist feminism. Uh, and it's an intersectional tradition. These women, black and white, have linked black rights to women's rights. Uh, and during Reconstruction, they are fighting for both. They're fighting for, for black men's right, black right to vote, and also for women's right to vote. What happens is that with the passage of the 14th and the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment introduces the word male for the first time in the US Constitution, and the 15th Amendment only enfranchises black men and not women. Um, there's a split amongst suffragists. And many of the old abolitionist feminists like Lucy Stone, but also black women like Frances Allen Watkins Harper say that they will not oppose the 15th Amendment. They see it as a step in the right direction uh, and that they would fight for women's rights. Unfortunately, some of the leading feminist theorists and organizers of this time, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, opposed the 15th Amendment and many times on elitist and racist grounds, saying, you know, we can't give the right to vote to what uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in a pretty racist and elitist statement says, Sambo, meaning uh, enslaved men, or what she called Hans and Young Tongue, which is German and Patrick, German and Irish immigrant men and uh, Chinese immigrant men and not give the right to vote to us, the daughters of the Republic. She's um, outraged that that has happened. Uh, but unfortunately, both Anthony and Stanton oppose the 15th Amendment, uh, and they break up this alliance 
uh, between abolitionists and feminists, and you have the rise of two different suffrage groups. And until they are reunited in 1890, the women's suffrage movement really does not take off. And I think it was um, uh, uh, a dismal moment, actually, for for women's the women's movement in the United States, uh, because instead of leaning into the intersectionality of the abolitionist feminists, they made this into competing causes, women's rights, which meant basically white women's rights for them, and black black men's rights. Um, and uh, that was an unfortunate moment in the American women's movement. And again, that leg legacy lives on for American feminism. Um, so if you're interested, you can look at this chapter on the women's question in the slave scores, uh, but also in my forthcoming book where I talk a lot about um, this, uh, this rupture in the suffragist movement um, and its implications um, for uh, American democracy and gender. So in terms mm -hmm. of the women I, I mentioned, sorry, I think I your specific question was, you know, who are the specific women? Um, some of my favorite women actually, uh, and though I appreciate both Stanton and Andrea Stanton, you know, despite her racism is a, is a very interesting feminist philosopher. Uh, and Anthony was an amazing organizer, but for me, Lucy Stone is one of those women who has been forgotten, the, one of those abolitionist feminist women who's been relatively forgotten, and other Black women who were abolitionists and also suffragists like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who famously said, um, you white women speak of rights, I speak of wrongs. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. I am. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm taking all of that in right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have a, a question. This may very well be the, the final question here. It's more of a personal question uh, as well. But um, Felicia's question, you may have seen it in the Q&A, but it's, uh, you know, relatively succinct question, which was what made you interested in studying this subject? What inspired your work, um, inspired the scholarship? Because it's, uh, yeah. it's so rich and it's so necessary. Thank you, uh, Felicia. Yeah, that's, you know, a lot of people ask me that because I was born in India. I grew up there. Uh, I came to this country when I was 21, which was a long time ago, uh, to graduate school to study um, U.S. history. Uh, and I was particularly interested in the in the civil rights movement um, because of the ways in which uh, civil rights leaders, going back to W.E.B. Du Bois, but particularly Dr. Martin Luther King, um, used uh, Mahatma Gandhi's notions of nonviolent struggle and the struggle for truth. Um, and uh, I saw a lot of overlap in that growing up in India. I was reading, you know, uh, letters from a Birmingham jail, Stride Towards Freedom, Martin Luther King's works. I also read um, the autobiography of Malcolm X. So I really got interested in this question of race and democracy and citizenship. And I saw its connections to decolonization in India and in Africa. Uh, from the British Empire, and I kind of worked my way back to slavery, um, and I really became interested in the politics of slavery. Uh, and later on, I just and so my first book was all about slaveholders uh, and pro-slavery ideology and their constitutional ideas. And the next book, I thought I wanted to write about people I actually liked, so I wrote a book on abolitionists, um, which really challenged. Um, uh, the view of abolition as, or at least a popular view of abolition as mainly a Northern white middle-class movement. And I really wanted to center African-Americans and especially enslaved black people uh, in the history of abolition. So I call it the slave scores, but that's a really long answer to your question. You know, I, I got interested in US history and I've always been so interested in these issues of um, the contested nature of American democracy around issues of, of race, around issues of national belonging and who belongs and does not, 
uh, and as an immigrant um, to this nation and seeing what has unfolded in our recent past, how these questions have come up again, it, it's something that I, I really enjoyed um, studying and writing about. Um, and yeah, that's that's how I came to to my particular subjects and sort of became um, interested in, in in the long 19th century of U.S. history. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we really, we truly appreciate it. There's so many takeaways tonight, and I, again, I want to thank you for for joining us, um, for leading us as as well as sharing your expertise with all of us. I think, especially thank you for encouraging us all to understand the more complex and nuanced uh, story of reconstruction, as well as his abolitionist roots. There were so many takeaways. Um, and I believe uh, we are, um, that is our time uh, for the evening. And uh, I think it was one other comment from Felicia. Yes, that's why I asked this question, why it would be important to you, why? I wish we could teach this in school. That was her response to your statement. But um, thank you all for, for spending your evening with us. Uh, special thanks to Michelle Neary for your service on the Teacher Advisory Council, as well as your presence and contributions to the chat this evening. We encourage you all to keep up with what's going on at the National Humanities Center. Um, follow us on all of our social media channel, uh, channels. And uh, feel free to reach out to me directly if you should have any questions. Next up, we have uh, our next webinar is Black Books, Books and Data in the 21st Century, which will be December the 13th next week. Our lead scholar is Mary Emma Graham. Um, it's designed to be another impactful, meaningful, and, and rich discussion. Um, we appreciate you all. Thank you for joining us, and, and, and we wish you all well and uh, continue to, to do the great things that you are doing in the classroom. Can't broken down that tire.